You're listening to the Scaling Culture Podcast, where we sit down with thought leaders who share their experiences building incredible workplace cultures. Our guest today is Kate Berardo, VP of Executive Development at Meta. In her role, Kate is charged with setting the leadership development strategy and developing Facebook's leaders to best equip them to lead into the future. She's a specialist in leadership and team development, women's leadership, executive coaching, and global skill building. Also, Kate is the author of two books, Building Cultural Competence, Innovative Frameworks and Activities, and Putting Diversity to Work, How to Successfully Lead a Diverse Workforce. In this episode of Scaling Culture, Ron and Kate discuss hybrid effectiveness, women and inclusive leadership, leading in complexity and reestablishing purpose and meaning as our social contracts with work are changing, and leader development, what's needed in the current times, and how do we best do this? Welcome to another episode of the Scaling Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Lovett, and today I'm very happy to welcome Kate Berardo, VP Executive Development at Meta. Kate, welcome to the show. Really pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. You know, uh, you're our first guest from the Meta. Can we still call Facebookers now? It's just don't don't do that. It's all Meta World now. Well, I mean, we do have Facebook as a product, but the company is Meta. Yes. So it's the, the umbrella. Everything is now branded. Did, when you go on Facebook, but that it still says Facebook. I haven't been on for a while. Yeah, Facebook as a product is very much okay. still here. Yes. So, Kate, you you um you have an unconventional you know, history, we, we've formally introduced you, but, but give us some color into your, your, your path that brought you here. And, and we'll probably stop at a few points because I think it's quite interesting. Yeah, you bet. It's a, it's a fun question to reflect on key moments that put you where you are today. For me, I'll start with um, a, my, the fact that my first job coming out of college, I was completely miserable in. Um, And I referenced that not to just lament and complain, but it ended up being very powerful for me. So first job I took out of college, very interesting time to graduate. Um, I am, I'm I'm outing myself in terms of my age. I I graduated in 2001 with my undergrad, but you can imagine this was a post.com bursting and then 9-11 shortly after graduation. So very interesting time in the U S and in the world um, to graduate first job. Felt very lucky. I joined a small skincare company. I was charged with launching the the product to the Spanish speaking market. Um, The role had prestige. It sort of was too good to be true for a first job out of college and should have checked all the boxes, like from everything that you get told at like a career center in college about what you should look for. It should have ticked those boxes. And I just was really unhappy. And um, I mentioned this to people because I think I I can, having lived through it, I, you know, people are like, I'm really unhappy in my role. I'm like, oh, that's good. Because now we can root cause and figure out why you're unhappy. And it's actually a cleaner path right. than being like mediocrely happy in a job. So it it really, that was a key moment in my career. And I, I did deep work when I was in my twenties to like actually um, understand the types of activities that really engaged me. And I went deep on Mihai Kazik Mihai's work of flow. So, and so- so, yeah. I want to go back there for for a second, and and yeah. you know because I, I find it interesting. I was when you were talking um, about that experience, I was thinking about um, I don't know if you've ever read the book Nine Lies About Work, Marcus Buckingham and Ashley Goodall. Have you read that book? Not that one, no. Great well, book. I'll, I'll send you a copy. Cool. I, it's fantastic, and it it uh, it talks about this concept of no one cares about what company they work for. And at first, you feel a little taken back. Like, what do you mean? Of course, if people care about Google and you know Meta or whatever, you know Southwest Airlines. But the point to this was you you don't actually care when you get there. You might care that might attract you to apply. But when you get there, if you don't like your leadership and the company culture and team, and I add, I think they just, they just talked about those two things. I would add the day-to-day activities that you do, then it's death by a thousand cuts if you don't have all three. Is, is, does, does your experience in your 20s fit there? What was missing? You know, um, I never was the type of person to seek out the optics of like, company title. Um, so that wasn't a driver for me or a disconnect. Um, for me, it was, it was the gift of like really looking at role. And I do think of that almost like stacking, like Maslow's hierarchy. Like if you're not doing work that you love, that's, you know, plays to your strengths, et cetera, 
even with great leadership and great culture, like that's, that's only right. going to carry you so far. Yeah. So it was really at that bottom of the pyramid that was the um, the deepest work I needed to do to really understand myself and, and how I wanted to spend my time and my career. And there was a book that came out about a couple a couple years after, and I was like, this is what I needed. It was the quarter life crisis. And I do feel deeply gra- like grateful that early in my career, I had to do that soul searching because it brought me deeply aligned with like my purpose, what I thought I could add. And that's powerful. And I actually know firsthand, like COVID, COVID brought up a lot of existential questions for people, right? Of like, am I doing this right? <laughs> Leading right now? Um, and then is this what I want to do? Because some of the gloss of our roles got burned away with some of the, you know, being in lockdown and things like that. So, so going back there, and I'm curious because, you know, you have all this stuff on quiet quitting, which is essentially one of those three things. I don't like my leader and I don't want to tell them I don't like them. I don't like the company or cult, the culture or team, or I don't like what I do. Sounds like, again, you were the third. I didn't, I, I had this aha moment of, I don't like what I'm doing every day, correct? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So how long, Kate, from realizing that to making a move to leaving, what was that? And if you go back in time, would you do the same would you handle it the same way? Would you, with the same speed, walk me through that? Yes. So, um, and quiet quitting is a fascinating topic um, for us to perhaps explore, but specific to your question, um, it was probably a couple months. And in those couple months, what I was literally doing was, was the work of mapping the kinds of things I was doing at work. And when I felt on point, on purpose, kind of aligned with my values, aligned with my strengths, and then, you know, different types of activities that my role was requiring of me that didn't fit that. And that process to map and then figure out, okay, well, if I were to craft a type of role that would fill my day with the kinds of things that really fulfill me, then I, had, then I was doing the due diligence to find that. So I think it was, a, it was a couple month process, pretty rigorous and systematic. And I, that was part of my checks and balances. Like you don't want to you don't want to move just to move. You want to move because you know what you're moving toward. Now, right. ironically, I moved to Japan, which I was like, they always have that career advice of like, you know, don't run away from a job. I'm like, geographically, I went as far as I probably could from California at the time. Um, but it was with clarity of purpose and that was helpful. So whatever timeline each person is on, I, I would measure it less by time that's elapsed on the clock and more the depth of thinking that's gone on in that time. You know, it's interesting because I, I, as I think about, you know, some people that go through some of these things today, I feel like they're only doing one side of that in, in some case. I'm generalizing here. What I mean is people are saying, I don't get energized by the work I'm doing today. I don't know if they get to the other side of the, the coin to say, what is energized me so I know clearly what I want to do next? You know, it sounds like you, you, you made sure that you were checking, balancing both of those things at the same time. So you did have at least a clear path on what was going to be next. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's an interesting reflection of there's um, early and easier insights as you're trying to land, you know, your sense of purpose and what you want to do. And then there's like the digging and yeah, mm-hmm. I did, I did digging and I believe deeply in it. I think all the, all the gold is a couple feet deep. So you gotta, gotta dig in on that. And that must've been, um, you know, mixed emotions because you, did you go through this? Well, am I going to be good at these things that I feel good about that align with my purpose and give me energy? Or am I, do I have imposter syndrome? Am am I going to just try that? Is this just a new thing I'm going to try? Because I kind of thought this was going to work for me. How did you feel when you're going through that? Um, I'm dating myself again, but I, I I am going to note, you're asking me to recall how I felt over 20 some odd years ago, (laughs) but (laughs) from what I can recall, so I might have a a bit of a revisionist history here. No, I remember, I remember having, that's why I think I named it soul searching. I, I, I was trying to figure out like, what's wrong with me that this high paying job that optically a lot of people would find very enviable, I'm not happy in. And that was the assumption that like something was wrong with me versus I hadn't, right. I hadn't aligned what I like to do with, with these options. Um, Interestingly, I mentioned Japan, the Japanese have this beautiful concept of ikigai, which is, you know, what you're good at, what you love doing, what the world needs, and what people are willing to pay for. And when you hit on all four of those, you get this incredible sweet spot. And I feel like I didn't have that model at the time. I was working more with the concept of flow, but that's what I was searching for. 
Um, and, and to be clear, this was not an HR role. I don't know if you clarified this was a marketing role or something, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. And by the way, those skills tr- helped me tremendously mm-hmm. today. So like, I also deeply believe all those experiences add up and accentuate. And it was helpful that I was in a line role in a business to start um, before coming into an HR role. And I've had lots of different configurations, you know, running my own company, joining other companies, small companies, Meta's arguably quite big now. Um, so I've, I've, I've run the the gamut and find that to be hugely additive. So Japan and, and bring us to Meta today. Yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a fast forward <laughs> because of the time lapse. Um, I moved from there to the South of France. I was working on a um, sort of an apprenticing situation there um, where I was helping with a cultural merger between um, three different countries and prior aeronautics companies coming together. And increasingly, so I, my, my work was centered a lot on intercultural communication. I'm, I'm married to a firefighter and I used to joke that we had the same job to go in and put out fires. Um, Cause I would get called in to cases where teams, uh, leadership teams were struggling with communication issues, trust issues. And part of my role was to help diagnose how much of that stemmed from national cultural differences, personality differences, company culture differences, less to label, but more to help people contextualize and therefore rehumanize and then contract and build together a better way of working. Yeah, yeah, we're very general yeah. because that seems like a very complex. But how do you how do you figure that out? Like that's a you just went through like okay, it's either personal or cultural. Like how do you even figure that out? What's the strategy? Well, so you go get a master. Well, you go get a master's in it. That'd be my top recommendation. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Helped. <laughs> It gave me theories and frameworks and so on. I lived in six different countries, so and and I think one of the things that's always helped me is being able to hold with a high level of complexity. So the honest answer is actually you don't cleanly figure it out. Yeah, it's not a two plus two equals four, or there's maybe a pattern that you've seen, there's an energy, you know? Well, and the worst thing to do is to attribute to one layer, like national culture. It's like you never engage with a national culture. You engage with someone from a national culture who may or may not be influenced by some of the typical characteristics of that culture because of their lived experiences and all the rest of it. So some of the work is honestly to give people enough of an architecture or a schema to help them understand some of these felt differences aren't personal and they're attributable to other things and not get them trying to oversimplify and attribute and stereotype and generalize, but use that to instead get curious and be like, let me deeply understand you now without the judgmental lens, because I've, you're doing things differently than me and realize, oh, you might have a different orientation to power, or you've grown up with a different understanding of good communication. And now how can I let curiosity be my guide? And then through that, we can devise a better way of working. So the short and long answers you, you, you do, it's a lot of lived experience, a lot of formal studies, and then actually a lot of living the work too, of trying to build systems to understand, but not getting overly um, tied to simplistic systematic understandings of things. Got it. So yeah. So, so let's keep moving. I want to go right to meta and then we're going to dive deep into that. Yeah. So long story now long, but, um, when I was doing that work with teams, I increasingly noticed how, um, leaders were just a lever in terms of the tone that they set, what they informally or formally, um, authorized. So I, I love the quote, don't know who to accurately attribute it to that says culture gets defined by the least desirable behaviors that a leader tolerates. Yeah, yeah and, that's great. I love that. Right. Isn't it good? And it just, yeah. it just, it prompts the follow-up question of like, right now, what's just one behavior that I'm probably tolerating because in and of itself, it's innocuous, but actually if it accumulates, if we start to see pattern, it will start to deteriorate our culture. So I just, I love the agency that that gives Anyhow, I I saw leaders as this lightning rod of potential, and I would, in my work, work really closely with these leaders, coaching them on how to create safety and work with these differences, et cetera. So that led me to leadership development. I worked in with a firm doing executive development for um, a number of years and had the privilege of getting line of sight to some of the top companies and their leaders, um, Nike, eBay, PayPal, WPP, McKinsey, and Facebook at the time. And Facebook approached me in 2016, ultimately to come inside, but I had been doing some programs with them for a number of years. And 
I was so fortunate to have had an inside glimpse of the culture and the leadership that I understood what I was, what was on offer in terms of what I was joining. And I was so impressed with what I saw that I was like, I, yeah, I wouldn't have left my gig at the time because it was very on point and very on purpose. And I was very happy. Um, but I could see the potential in Facebook and the caliber of people and how they brought people together that I was like, I want to play in this space. And well, yeah, what did you see? Tell me what, what you saw that said, wow, this is just easy, you know? Um, at the time it was people, people say this, so it feels slightly cliche as I say it, but it's my honest answer, which was, I, I was deeply impressed by the people. Um, and why, what, what, what about them impressed you? Um, things like, sure. They're like sheer intelligence, the horsepower, the caliber of the thinking, um, the desire to innovate and really solve complex problems was very powerful, um, but I also saw that matched with a degree of, um, you know, emotional intelligence in terms of uh, it, it was a culture, and I think it's something we've been trying to preserve over time, um, but it was a culture where people also just assumed trust and competence. And like, what a gift that is, right? When you, everybody just drops in, it's like, I assume you do what you do very well. I assume your producer, Maddie, does it very well what she does. And like, we just drop right. in and go. We're not doing right. any of the typical energy cycles, protection, et cetera. And like what that opens up in terms of enabling a high-performing culture is I find incredible and, and relatively rare. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. I would agree. I mean, that's the complete opposite of command and control micromanagement. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. And so you join, you know, obviously trying to figure out this organization, drinking from a fire hose. Did you start at the VP of executive development? Did you start? I started way? at a director level, okay. by the way, kudos on the, the drinking from the fire hose and using fire analogies, given my husband's background. Hey, hey. <laughs> yes. I wrote down, husband's a firefighter. You try to work it in somehow. Yes. Um, so no, I, I joined as a director and then have been promoted um, to VP. I uh, was promoted a couple of times. So we had, um, and then yeah, got to VP level. So we're probably going to jump around a little bit here, but I, I'm curious, I want to go actually to learning for a minute because, can, and can you give me some, and, and the listeners some context, what does that, like, what does a day look like in your work in, in, as the VP of executive development, just, you know, high level, what does that look like? Oh, I have, uh, hands down, I think one of the best jobs on the planet. So, um, part of the answer is that we're tied because I love my job. <laughs> you, we, it's a competition now, huh? <laughs> I love it. Um, my day, I mean, if we take today as an example, will be anything from thinking through strategically, how are we going to um, develop our uh, most senior leaders next year? What do they need? How do we go after that? Um, what are the right forms of um, engagements, interventions that are going to support their development? I may be um, dropping in live. So that team development work where I will be called in, I, I deeply believe like the less friction or space between where, when somebody learns and when they have a chance to apply it, the better. So I deeply believe in doing work where you're working with leaders in situ in their natural work environments and helping them live feedback. And so I might be dropping into some teams to support that work, whether it's observing a meeting or um, I may be coaching leaders or last week I spent a whole week do, in a deep dive development program for some of our um, leaders. So it, it varies, but um, I have a, a laser focus. I'm very much a specialized type of role, uh, really thinking holistically about the needs of our leaders and then designing, developing, delivering. Is training part of that, Kate, or not? This is leadership development. This is kind of mm -hmm. like different than training, right? You're not mm -hmm. training mm -hmm. me to negotiate your developing my servant leader skills or, co you know, listing skills or coaching skills, those types of things, right? Yeah, I'm not responsible for um, functional learning. So, um, yeah. you know, if it's, I'm, if we're trying to work sales and nails enablement or coding skills, that's not in my remit. I'm focused much more, and I wouldn't actually say I do much training. I yeah, do yeah. facilitating, I yeah. do development, I create products, learning products that help our leaders grow in their roles. Um, I design programs, but we, one of our design principles, we rely deeply on it, So, I mean, if you just rewind, if you think about the caliber of leaders that I described, yeah, it would be a disservice for me to design something where they're not tapping into each other's wisdom, you know? Right. Right. So you design in a different way when that's what you also um, are, you know, the type of people you get to work with. 
But I'm curious, like, so, so if I'm a leader at Meta, have you been told, you know, we've, uh, you know, through your, your colleagues or my peers, we've identified, we've noticed this behavior with Ron, and we think that, that, that this would be helpful. And then you have a discussion with me, and I'm either aware of it, not aware, like, I'm just curious how the, the, the life cycle of this, and I know that might change a little bit, but how does that start? So again, you, you, you notice something in me, I come to you, like, how, how does it tip? What's the typical process? So one of the things that might be helpful to complex, like to contextualize this is recognizing in my role, I'm thinking about the needs of a sales leader in Indonesia and maybe a policy leader who's working in DC um, or a silicone researcher in Redmond. So it's, it's quite a broad um, swath of expertise and types of leaders um, that I think things through. Now, like any organization, of course, those leaders have, and we have for those leaders, systems, be it our performance system, be it our you know pulse system, or we're, we're reading the, the culture that gives all kinds of touch points that might be the genesis of a leader understanding, hey, I got, or I might just get some feedback from somebody on my team. And I'm like, that's interesting. Or uh, I might have a new remit. And I'm being honest that like, there's pieces of this that I feel very clear to me about how to go after, but due to the complexity, the zero to one build on something, I need support and really thinking about how to go after that. So the genesis can be a lot of different things, but I actually think when we do this work well, we're also anticipating right. people's needs um, before yeah, they may open. always be conscious of the need arising. And that's from, yeah, scanning the system, understanding yeah. where the industry is going, understanding how leadership expectations are shifting and changing, and then trying to meet the moment. What's what's generally the hardest part of that? Is it is it holding someone to account and getting them to buy into their learning, like getting them to execute on new learning? What's the what's the bottleneck? Or what's the most challenging part of that cycle? I don't know that I have. It's funny. I I, I do work a lot and support leaders a lot in leading and complexity, which tends to resist these unilateral <laughs> answers. So I, I hear myself struggling on that. Um, so I can do it in terms of personas. Um, so I think for some people, like I noticed this with, with COVID, there were some people who were like, this is a, a once in a, hopefully once in a lifetime type of situation. And I don't feel equipped. Give me everything you got about how we we're going to lead through this moment. And then there were other people who had a bit more of a, I'm, I barely have it together. I can't step away. I can't take the time. So I, I think that's probably for me, like once people want to learn, it can be an incredible, incredible, I mean, it is a very incredibly powerful process. And when you do it, I think in a decently sophisticated way, like insight can't not translate into action and change of behavior and so on and so forth. Um, but I would say that's one of the barriers, like to what degree do people see right. learning as a hundred percent critical, like the only way to keep growing. And there's sometimes an interesting um, contrast between people feeling like they need to grow their role, but not seeing how they need to grow themselves in order to grow in the role. And what's the, what's the balance cape between, I think, you know, as I kind of reflect and I was telling the story the other day, you know, I'd said before we got started, I'm dyslexic. And so I have a very different view on finances. And when I sold my uh, original company and got into real estate, we were just scaling so quickly, you know, we did 5 million in assets and boom, you blink and you have 350 million of assets. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I felt, I did feel like I had some imposter syndrome. I just thought, geez, you know, I should know. I struggle sometimes with, with looking at the deep underwriting of these assets we're buying. And I was like, you know, maybe I should go back to school. I literally went down this path of, of researching, you know, going, I've never went to university, but I was going to go to like community college and take some basic finance and accounting. And then I did some soul searching too, mm. uh, to use your words. And I kind of got to a place and I thought, you know, I'm just not going to be good at this. And I'm, there's always going to be someone around me that that is going to be better. And so so landing on the place that why don't I take that same time and effort and get better at where I'm good? And so my question is, how often is that like, okay, Ron, let's let's get you better. You're already good. Let's get you excellent versus let's make a change in something that is a mini blind spot. How do, and you know, how do you, how do you, how do you prioritize those types of, you know, of learning or, 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 or development in your leaders? 
Yes. Um, so I have quite a few thoughts on a lot of the different yeah. threats. First off, imposter syndrome is much more common than I think we honor. And if you even think about like the environment I was describing, that was what compelled me to join Facebook at the time. Now Meta, it was like the caliber of people. Well, you then need to go immerse yourself in that culture. Right. And it is hard not to be like, whoa, can I hang? Right. Um, so some of that I think is can be a natural byproduct of actually strong cultures sometimes. Um, your point really resonates with me of um, nobody needs to be an expert in everything. And we talk a lot about strengths-based leadership, which means it's something you're good at and that gives you energy. Right. So like I can navigate an Excel spreadsheet with a decent amount of fluidity but it does not give me energy. And I have worked with people and it impresses me like th their desire to make like, you know, formulas click and so on and so forth. I'm like, good on you because that is, that does not give me energy. So I believe deeply in that. And I also be, believe deeply when you're working with people at the caliber we do, most of my work is deeply focused on bringing out next echelon level of leadership, right? It's right. just like, it's not a, it's not a Delta gap remedial approach. It's like, we're going to go through a whole new evolution, even as a company. And that is going to require a similar evolution from you as a leader, whether it's scaling. I'm sure you went through this, Ron, where it's like, yeah. you know, one year you might have a small team and the next year it's morphed into a big team. Your form of leadership is going to need to pretty fundamentally change. And oftentimes people hold on to formulas that were successful for them in the past, but it won't serve them in the future. So there's a, there's just a natural rewriting that we need to do as we grow in our leadership. So, but we were talking about change management. I know everybody's different, but generally what's the, what's the cycle of that? It's like, okay, Ron, you know, you, you how do you get my buy-in, you know, and, and then, you know, how it, it must be, I go through a process, then execute and then see if I, if I'm doing it properly and then go back and learn some more, like, give me the, the, the flywheel of this, you know? One of the things um, that I love to design is um, systems that create flywheels. So I wouldn't describe a singular life cycle, so to speak. Like, it's not like you become aware, then you get trained, then you, okay. then you go back and apply. Like that is a, I almost apply, it implies a form of homeostasis in an organization that we honestly don't just see too. So um, I tend to design multi-layered forms of um, learning even products. So one of the things that surprises people, you can see I've got a Oculus headset behind me. Um, so I, I work for a very high tech company. And some of the things that I have shipped to our leaders to help them grow have been things like an analog Write it, write it down leadership planner, which we're talking audio. So yeah, I love that. Yeah, can you, can you actually, uh, for yeah. those who are just listening, not watching, can you explain that you're, you're holding it, but Kate, just dive a little deeper into that. Yeah. So imagine part of what we're trying to do as we help people grow is, is find the catalyst that's going to awaken within them a desire, understanding, recognition of of a space that they can grow into, like the future beta version of themselves, like get some kind of glimpse of that and be like, I should go build that, right? Um, this planner, you know, it's some of it's based off some really fascinating research, which is like 15 minutes of reflection each day can increase productivity and performance by about 23%. Wow. Now I work with technical audiences sometimes that can calculate those types of analyses. That's a high ROI, right? And so- but what we also know, and there's been some very interesting research, is you've got to find ways to interrupt people's patterns in a, in a way that invites a different level of discovery, right? So we all spend, I saw some statistic that says, I think it's here in the US, it's like 10 hours and 39 minutes in front of a screen is the average time people spend. I know there was a study in Britain that said people spend more time on technology than they do sleeping now. Um, so what's the antidote? If you want to do something different, you're not going to try and, and of course we have high-tech solutions too, but what a, what a gift to actually bring people out of that system for a second to help right. them see themselves in that system, et cetera. And so, you know, there's also really interesting research that shows when we write things down, it registers differently in our prefrontal cortex. And so we're just inviting some of those initial thought starters. And again, with some of our population, it can be, it can, it can start with something as small as like a five minute reflection and build toward, you know, a seven week in-depth experience because you're in a defining moment and we're going to help you re, you know, rewrite how you lead. 
Um, but you're looking as you know, a designer of learning and a designer of systems, you're looking for a lot of different potential levers that will all get that flywheel going. And then, right. you know, we have labs that are 90 minutes that will be in between. So we're also catering back to that wideness of and diversity of leaders to different people needing different things at different times. So trying to cater to that rather than saying everybody has to go through the standardized process to learn, which you and I are both already bored by when we say it. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, so, is this, are some of these strategies, are they piloted and saying, oh, wow, we are getting that result or is this external research and boom, off we go? What does it look like within Meta? Yeah, I mean, I I am really fortunate to come and work for a company that believes in piloting and dog fooding, which means testing your own products and yeah. uh, prototyping and beta version testing and um, everything I believe that is good that we've created has also been co-created. So we have, a, you know, I rolled out a leadership framework at one juncture and it had the fingerprints of yeah, so many of our leaders on it. And that was critical for its success, but it was also part of how we started to knit it into the system is that we had a very early version of it. We were testing for the need for it. Then we were testing the components of it. Um, so yes, and it may start with a kernel of external research or internal data that we have for sure. But um, I, I definitely work in a those sort of product development type space, which gives me a lot of License to build learning in a similar way that we tend to also build products, test, learn, get feedback, enhance, et cetera. Right. Same way you deal with your customers. You're, you're doing internal process the same way. I love that. So let's change direction a little bit. Let's talk about social contract. Um, you, you and I had discussed this quickly before turning, uh, going live, I should say. What are your views on that? I, I, don't, I, I hear social contract. I still don't really understand it. Can, can you explain it to me and then your views on it? Yeah, um, there is. A, we we live in a world right now where terms can um, go viral at a faster rate than the meaning behind them does. Even quiet quitting, we talked about earlier, I think could be in that camp. Um, for me personally, when I think about the idea of a social contract, it's sort of what is we have it at multiple layers. I have a form of a social contract with my husband in the form of our, our marriage, right? And it's the expectations each of us has about our relationship. So what I believe, this is just my personal opinion, but like in the US, I know you're up in Canada, but in the US, we have historically had a pretty strong um, live to work type of culture. And I think one of the hidden benefits in a incredibly hard way, um, was the effects of COVID really helping people recalibrate around what's important? How do I want to spend my time? What is meaningful? And therefore, how does that shape what I'm looking for in an employer? And my, my personal sense is at least there's been shifting dynamics within that social contract. Like in some cases, it's become more straightforward. Like I'm just actually here for a job, which isn't how I roll. I'm very purpose-driven, but I think for some people, it has um, burnt away some uh, additional layers of meaning and clarified for them. And then for other people, they're looking even more so for deeper meaning. And so they're looking for a, a purpose-driven type of job, but that just introduces range in that social contract of like, what am I coming to the table hoping for? What do I expect from you um, as my employer? And we've seen shifts in that too. Like there was, for a while, there was a lot of emphasis in company cultures on um, family, right? Like having a familial like culture. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that as being one of the maybe concrete examples of how the social contract has changed. It's saying, is that actually healthy to want your work 100%. to be like your family? And should we, should we down ratchet that down a little bit to say you want like, and that was just, that was like two years ago that that started to change, right? Is that yeah, the same thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I find that fascinating. I think it's a healthy exercise for us to even look at unconscious attributions we're making of like a culture is your family and so on and you know work culture is your family etc so so i talk about our culture and i say this and i'm wondering if this can you explain to me if this is our version of so maybe this is our social contract just so i want to make sure i understand so i say to uh you know to folks that are joining our company and, and that work with us that our job as an employer are to bring out the best version in people and we do that on all kinds of different fronts Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with our benefit package and, and coaching, mentoring, uh, unlimited vacation with mandatory life days and life coaching and all these different, you know, physical training twice a month, all this different stuff for that, 
I would say, look, this isn't a country club, it's high performance. And so the expectation we get the best version of you here is that would that be our social contract? A hundred percent. That's a beautiful, I think, articulation of it, at least as I interpret it. Right. And okay. what's interesting in your example is in any of those altitudes, there could be a breach of perception of that contract. Mm -hmm. So if somebody sees a behavior that say, hey, it doesn't actually feel like you're trying to bring the best out in me. Or you say, hey, one of those benefits we're taking off the table, we're changing the social contract or at least the manifestation of the social contract. And so we have to be mindful of what we're navigating, communicating, how we're living up to the social contract too. Got it. Let's go, if it's okay, I want to go up personal for a sec. Your your husband, uh, who's a, I think he's a, uh, he manages the fire department there. He's a, he's a mm-hmm. fire chief. Deputy chief, yep. Deputy chief. Big job. You have two daughters. You have yes. Emma and Maddie. Yes. So- you know, obviously, what are the ages, if you don't mind, of your Yeah, children? Maddie's eight. It's her, actually, she's eight and a half as of today. She was very clear on announcing it was her half birthday today. <laughs> Nicely done, Maddie. Happy oh, birthday, yeah. eight and a half birthday, Maddie. Yeah, eight and a half. <laughs> Counting it all these days. And uh, Emma will be six in January. Okay. You've had incredible uh, career path. How was that managing, you know, children? And, 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 I'm, and you know, make an easy assumption um, a husband who's working lots. And maybe, I don't know, if, like in Canada, the firefighters, I don't know if that level they were at it, but 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 a general firefighter is like four days on, two days off, or three on, one off, something like that. Um, your your perception is spot on um, okay. in terms of the, my my husband's worked different types of roles, but one of his has been on a strike team. So he'll, he'd will he go out to respond to the large scale wildfires that we see in California. Um so independent of the like the the shift schedule, which he's actually shifted away from, he goes out on those. So even during COVID, he was gone for 40, 40 days, I think, in a row wow. at one juncture, which was quite hard. Um, I have to say, you were 100% spot on on the assumption that my husband uh, has a pretty intense job. And certainly I do as well. You made me laugh in the framing of the question because like, how was it to manage kids? I'm like, still in process, 100%. Right, of course, right, Sorry. <laughs> um, But um, it is a, one of the things I will say this at a maybe philosophical level, and then I'll break it down more practically. But one of the things I don't think gets emphasized enough is just how symbiotic and um, complementary being a parent and being a professional can be. And I mean that simply in the, in the sense of like, I am a hundred percent a better leader because I am a parent. And for me, I'm a better parent because I'm also a leader and I work. That's not everybody's equation, but it's definitely mine. And nobody ever points that out when you're thinking about having kids, because from a time perspective, they are in direct and constant conflict. Yes. (laughs) So, yeah, and I can bring this to life. I mean, my, I mentioned I joined internally in 2016. I had this incredible experience. And I remember it because I was literally in labor with Maddie. It was therefore June 20th of 2014. She was born June 21st, hence why it's now her eight and a half birthday. Um, And I was, please don't judge this. I was looking at my phone. It was about 30 hours into labor and needing a distraction. You're Uh, loud. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) Um, And I got an email that was from Facebook. I was a consultant doing work for them. I coached, um, but it was an invitation to join um, and to design, not join the company at the time, but to design a women's leadership program. This was after Lean In from Cheryl. She was, you know, and still is on our board of directors, just an incredible leader on women's issue. And it was, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. And it literally came in right when I'm about to like have my first child. So, so. I'm going, I'm flying the wall and I'm visualizing like that you weeping because you're, it is an emotional moment. You're already emotional anyways. And the doctor wondering if you're okay. And you're saying like, this has nothing to do with what's going on. This is different. I'm just an email that has touched me. You know, you asked earlier about what I was feeling. Uh, I actually, I do remember the feeling of labor. I, I'm not sure I was weeping with joy. I'm pretty sure I was probably weeping in deep pain at the time and was looking for a distraction. And I'm not sure I could fully access the fully access the joy that was in that email, but it was like, it, it, it was this like, whoa, there's a lot going on at the same moment. Good and energy all, burst. But yes. Yes. But you can imagine it was a, a very um, poignant moment for me. And I really had to examine, I had fears as many women do, and probably don't talk enough about, about 
the implications of potential like stepping away to focus in on having kids and you know in the US compared to many other countries we don't have the same we have especially at Meta we have some of the most generous but it's privatized there's not the same degree of um, support that you sometimes see in other countries so I was grateful I didn't work at Meta at the time but we see those differences um, and I had to fundamentally and I, I remember I had a, a I believe deeply in women supporting each other and I'm incredibly fortunate to be surrounded by wickedly smart, talented women and leaders who we kind of have our own social contract that we're going to fiercely support each other. And it has lifted and shifted and put all of us, I think, on fabulous trajectories. But I remember saying to one of those women, I'm like, if I really try and hone in on what I want, I think I want to go after this opportunity because it just feels so powerful and so aligned. And like, how can I, when I'm about to bring a girl who's going to be a future woman and a future leader into this world, how can I not simultaneously create a program that's trying to create a better future for women? Like it just felt so like there's right. a reason that these are side by side and it's going to be wicked hard to pull it off. Right. Like right. I did change right. my, at the time I, you know, changed my plans and I was trying to figure out how to make, you know, both happen. But I had this amazing woman which, friend who was just like, wait a minute, I think you're trying to not be judged. And I'm like, yeah, I just, I'm really worried. Like moms won't understand it. You know? And she's like, oh, oh, you're going to be judged any way you do it. Don't worry oh, about yeah. that. <laughs> and it was so kind of liberating just to right. have like a truth teller next to me being like, right. solve for what's your truth and go Lean after it, it. And we will yeah. support you in it. And mm -hmm. I had a great, I had a great cadre of women who helped me through that. And that I believe deeply in. So there's no formula. I think it's very hard. I think we, sometimes as women, I've been very lucky, but women can can face all kinds of um, kind of uh, things that make their lives harder. And then mm -hmm. when you become a mom, that can just pragmatically become harder. And we haven't yet even looked at other elements of diversity and how that impacts women's experience if you're a woman of color or something like that. Um, so yes, there's no formula. It's hard. Um, and if there's anything I've seen that's cut through, it's actually the support of other people and by the way, they aren't all moms. So I, I don't believe right. in this idea that you have to have lived the same experience to be deeply supportive of someone else. Um, in that cadre of women were some who were too young to have decided if they wanted kids, another who knew and had never had kids and knew she didn't want them. And that was part of the power of the support is that it was untied to the similarity of our situation. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. And thanks for sharing that. I um netted out okay for me, as you can probably tell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I see. yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I want to I want to kind of finish on this topic because I'm super curious about this. So so I don't know much about you know when I hear meta now, I I think of like the 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 meta universe and like putting the goggles on and and what's that called three D or there, no? There's another term for virtual it. reality and virtual reality, metaverse yeah. maybe. Yep. Metaverse. It's called the metaverse, right? You're going mm -hmm. into this thing. So. I was just in uh, Nigeria a few months, two months ago, not even maybe a month ago. Um, and a young man, I was in Lagos, he came to meet me and he wanted to demonstrate with 3D goggles in the metaverse. First time I've ever seen this. And what he was saying is, look, we could do tours of your apartments and you could you could be in the metaverse and, and you could do the tour. And I was like, oh, Jesus, this is fantastic. Let's do this. So so I think like I'm, I'm thinking thoughtfully about how do we apply this technology to our business? But parking that for a minute, that was just my experience with it. I've seen videos online, I think with Mark Zuckerberg of, of showing what the workplace potentially could look like. Mm -hmm. And like you, you, you show up to work in a meeting as an avatar. And, and I, you know, of course, like when I look at it, I'm like, what, how in the, what, how is this going to work? I'm just curious your thoughts, like in, in that strategy, like what, what becomes as you think, because I, I I don't know if many people are doing that. By the way, if that's a technology that's coming, I don't even know. Maybe you can you can clarify what becomes the the real like um, benefits to move us forward, and what are the challenges in that that you see potentially? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yes, the technology we we have we certainly have that technology. We do meetings in work rooms where um, we join a space that physically feels like we're all in the same room. So. When okay, sorry, and sorry to interrupt. You actually like tomorrow you could have a meeting. Mm -hmm. You see me there. We're not on Zoom. We're actually in these like what does that look like? You're, we're in the. You have a you have we glasses can, on. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would, if I were at my desk, I would have the, the headset behind me on. But what I would experience was being um, in a space with other colleagues. And, you know, when, this is probably worth its own podcast, but you can imagine as we're thinking about hybrid effectiveness, um, the felt difference between people who are meeting face-to-face -face versus when they're meeting just like we are right now with a Zoom screen. And the felt experience, if you can imagine, you probably got a sense of this when you were in Lagos, is that in that room, just like if you were sat to my left, when you speak, the spatial audio cues to me will have you on my left. And so what it is doing is bridging some of that perceived distance that gives us an actual sense that we're in the same environment together. And the power of that in terms of feeling like we're all around in the same space, working it, we can whiteboard things, I can do things like a pass through, which means I can be working on my actual laptop while I have my headset on and be sharing slides with you. So it merges these two different worlds, like it then facilitates a different kind of collaboration. So incredible technology. Um, early days. So to your question of like um, hindrances, like I need you to have a headset, right? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we got to just make sure we've got some of the um, core needs enabled and it needs to be charged. Like sometimes it's just the small things. It's like, ah, we got to make sure we're solving oh, for right. those to, yeah, to yeah. enable us to then reap the beautiful benefits of these types of um, opportunities. And, and, and I'll also say just one other thing. I don't yeah. know if you heard this, but I read once that when they first invented the TV, they used it to film radio. So they broadcast on TV, people talking on radio. Interesting. And so, I mean, we have incredible plans for what we want to do in the metaverse, but I'm also in the like, I, I think there could be more that we don't yet even fully understand about the possibility of this new horizon in front of us. It's not going to arrive tomorrow, but I, I get excited about that when you think about even how much TV has changed from those days where it was mm -hmm. filmed in black and white and recording somebody talking because that was the idea of how you'd advance the technology at the time. Well, thanks. For, I mean, that that brings different context to it because at first glance, I could I could understand the the customer side, customer experience, but I couldn't really get my head around the colleague working together side. I just couldn't. I just I was like, well, would I? With Zoom actually, you know, or whatever platform, virtual platform, is that going to be better than, because I'm assuming again, Kate, that if we're in this room, I don't see you. I, I see an avatar of you, right? It's not really you. It could be a, you could have fun and maybe change this avatar. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, could I, it's not going to replace, like, I, it's interesting. I, 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 I'm, you know, I thought it's quite interesting about, about the sound and how that comes into the headset. I, I think that that's quite uh, unique, but I assume I still can't feel the energy, right? Well, I think that's the question. So I, I mentioned that I started in my career doing um, intercultural work. And I still remember, I think I was facilitating a session in Spain and in Spanish, which really tested my language and facilitation skills. ¿Habla español? Sí, claro que sí. No. <laughs> Porque vivía por un ratito en Salamanca. Uh, anyhow. No, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But in that example, I remember at the time we were talking, I think about the legitimacy of phone conference calls. I'm trying to, I'm trying to place the mm -hmm. timing of this mm. and figure out where technology was. The very first time I lived abroad, it was like care packages and very expensive phone calls. And then we moved to Skype and, right. you know, now we have all kinds of ways to connect in a much higher quality fashion. But I remember working with a participant um, in that session. And one of the things he said to me really stuck out. And he said, you know, I just can't ever see that any form of virtual connection will replace in person because you can't replicate chi, which if, for that person's culture meant energy. And I think interestingly, you start taking some of the components of what VR is. And I think if we can crack that, mm. It, it can fundamentally change. I would love to change some of those statistics. I listened to one of your prior podcasts where people were talking about the Delta and trust building between one face-to-face -face and I forget what it was. It was like 44 texts. I'm like, man, right. we got to yeah. bridge that divide because not everybody can meet face-to-face -face all the That's time. Right. And like, we don't want to limit the collaboration and the amazing, you know, work that can happen. So um, I'm hopeful on that front. TBD, let's see. So, so Kate, let's end with what's the, what's the biggest, um, why don't you pick your path? What's the biggest, the, the most exciting thing in front of you 
or the biggest challenge that you've that you've got in front of you now, or maybe they're they're the one and the same. They might be one and the same. It might be just different sides of the same coin. And the, the question is, can you can you can you take any opportunity, you know, challenge and turn it into an opportunity? I think we are on the brink of at a global level, just a um a very interesting time and space. So I was listening to um Ari Wallach, who wrote the book Long Path. It's this beautiful idea of how we think um he he describes us having what's called temporal narcissism, meaning temporal, sorry, temporal temporal narcissism, okay. meaning most of us orient our notion of time with us at the center of it, our, our own lives, our own lifespans. And the invitation is what if we think about every decision we make as being more of an heirloom decision that it affects generations to come. And what opens up in terms of that long path thinking when you sit down at the table with your three kids or I sit down with my two kids and even engage with that lens, like what we do here will have an impact Hmm. for generations to come. Um, What And one of the reasons he notes that we struggle with that is that he would describe we're in a bit of an intertidal space, which means we know we don't want this post-consumerism, like we're in some kind of mode, but we don't yet know the, that future space that we want to move into. And without that, it can be harder to think longer mm-hmm. term. So in my world, that translates into really thinking deeply about like, what's the leadership that's going to be needed to complete this generation for the generations to come to meet the way that the world is moving and in the direction that it's moving. And I I see trends that deeply excite me. I, we've seen a generational shift from a, a much more take charge or what you were referencing. I think, I can't remember if it was during our call or before of the command and control yeah. to much more of a take care, this need for leaders to um, really genuinely care for their workforce and think about their development in a different way. So I'm seeing these really positive trends. Um, the complexity that leaders at Meta navigate is pretty bar none. Um, and I think- that requires a very different way of leading than even we have trained people in universities yeah. to really think about what is your role in complexity. And it's very different than um, the control you have in just a more complicated reality. So I get very excited by that. I'm just like really thinking through the like, reminds me of, you know, when you go to a train station, it's like one thing changes and it goes and everything behind it. And like, I love that. Like just trying to think through all the tick throughs of like, what will that mean for leadership? And then how can I be readying our leaders in support of that? Um, So I find that a fascinating and fruitful line of thinking. Absolutely. Kate, it's been a wonderful conversation. It's been great to get a chance to speak to you. Uh, Thanks so much for giving your time and, and coming on the show today. It was my deep pleasure. Thanks, Ron. For more information about Kate, please follow her on LinkedIn. To learn more about our books or our Scaling Culture Masterclass on how to build and sustain a resilient, high-performing team, please go to scalingculture.org. And lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a comment and share the podcast with one of your friends and colleagues. We'll be back soon with another incredible guest.